In this take-up video, I'm going to be taking up question 6 on page 13 of the energy workbook, and it's found in the in topic 6 of the homework. So, I want to start this question by drawing a little diagram of what the question is telling us, and it kind of just helps us to better understand what the question wants us to do, and what it's given us. So here I've drawn um, the piece of hot copper. I'm just gonna label it block and C and it tells us that it's 200 grams. And actually the unknown is the initial temperature of the copper. So now I'm gonna draw the water, which is 1.0 kilograms and is at 5.0 degrees Celsius. And now there's a mixture of both of these together. And here's our little copper block. Here's our water. So, and it tells us that the final temperature of the mixture is 50 degrees Celsius. So now that I'm done with the diagram, I'm going to make a more formal list of the givens on this side. So the mass of the copper is 200 grams, but it's also equal to 0 0.200 kilograms. And the reason why this is important is because all of our formulas are using the mass as kilograms. So if we use it as grams, we're gonna get the wrong answer. And then the heat capacity of the copper is 3.8 times 10 to the two joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And I got this capacity value from page 12 of the workbook, which lists all the heat capacities we would need to know. So that's the heat capacity of the copper. And then we need to find the initial temperature of the copper, which is an unknown. So I'm just gonna leave that as a question mark. Now the mass of the water is 1.0 kilograms and the heat capacity of the water is 4.18 times 10 to the 3 joules per kilogram degree Celsius and then it tells us that the initial temperature of the water is 5.0 degrees Celsius. So the question also tells us that the, the final temperature of the mixture is 50 degrees Celsius. But something I want to note here is really T2 is equal to T2 water, which is equal to T2 of copper. So what this means is that the both the final temperature of the water and the final temperature of the copper is the same. So we don't actually need to specify T W of T, T two W or T two C because they're really the same, so we can just call it T two. And the last thing I want to do with the givens is find out the change in temperature for the water. And the reason why we can do this is because we know the T two and the T one for water, but we can't do this for the copper because we know T one of the copper. We know T2 of the copper, but we don't know T1 of the copper. So we can't do this for the copper. So it's going to be T2 minus um, T1 water, which is 50 degrees Celsius minus 5.0 degrees Celsius. And that's going to become 45 degrees Celsius. No decimal places because there's no decimal places over here. So there is our change in temperature for the water. So now we're done with the givens for the question and we can start by solving for T1 of the copper. So a good way to start this is by saying that the change in temperature for the copper is equal to the change in change in thermal energy, sorry, the change in thermal energy for the copper plus 
the change in thermal energy for the water is equal to zero. And what this means is that the, um, the energy uh, loss by the copper is going to be equal to the amount of energy gained by the water. And because of that, this value will be negative, this value will be positive, but the magnitude will be the same, so it's going to be equal to zero. And this formula also stands true to the law of conservation of energy, which states that matter cannot be created energy cannot be created nor destroyed in a closed system. So it basically just proves that theory, or it supports the theory, I guess. Um, and then we can expand this out further by saying mass of copper times heat capacity of water times the change in temperature of the copper plus mass of the water. Oh, it's supposed to be a C mass of the water times heat capacity of water times change in temperature for the water equals zero. So, oh, this is supposed to be C, sorry. Um, and then what we can say is we can expand this temperature only, but not this one. The reason why is because we solved for this variable here already, so there's no reason to actually expand it. But the reason why we want to expand this value is because then we can uncover the T1 from this variable. And that's what we're trying to solve for. So it's going to look like mass of copper times heat capacity of copper. So T2, there's no reason to say. There's no reason to say. T1 for, I mean, T2 of copper because it's the same thing, like I said before up here, and minus T1 copper. So there is the variable we're trying to solve for, and we're going to have to try to isolate this. So then this part just stays the same mass water, heat capacity of water, delta T water equals zero. So now what we can do is move. Um, uh, we can move this variable over to the other side to isolate for T1. So we're going to get mass copper, heat capacity copper, T2 minus T1C equals negative because it's moved over to the other side, mass water, heat capacity water, delta T water. And now what we can do is divide both sides by the mass of copper and the heat capacity of copper. And on this side, the mass is this will cancel out, and on this side, we just divide. So we're going to get T2 minus T1 copper equals negative M water C water delta T water over M C C C. So now to isolate for the T1 of the copper, we can move the T2 over to the other side. And we'll get mass water, sea water, sea water. This part just stays the same, no changes here. And now this becomes a minus because the T2 is moved over to the other side. So now the last step we really need to do is because we don't want this to be a negative value, obviously, um, we're just essentially gonna divide everything here by negative one. So for here, the negative one would just cancel out. You're left with positive. Here, same thing, this whole thing is going to become positive now. Mass water, delta T, okay. And now this is going to become a positive because if you were to divide this by negative 1, you're going to get positive T2. So now we're done with the algebra, and all we need to do now is sub in our values. So the mass of the water is 1.0 kilograms times the heat capacity of water, which is 4.18 times 10 to the three joules per kilogram degrees Celsius, and then times the change in temperature of the water, which is 45 degrees Celsius. We calculated this right at the beginning, and we're gonna do that whole thing divided by the mass of the copper, which is 0.200 kilograms times heat capacity of the copper, 
which is 3.8 times 10 to the 2 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And then that whole thing plus the uh, final temperature, which is 50 degrees Celsius. So I've already done this calculation before starting the question. So what you should get is 2525 degrees Celsius. And because we have to round it to two significant figures, if we look back at the question here, you'll see that the lowest number of significant figures is two. So we can say that the final temp the initial temperature of the copper is approximately 2.5 times 10 to the three degrees Celsius. So 2,500 degrees Celsius. And there is our final answer. And now all that's left is to make your therefore statement. Therefore, the initial temperature of the water, no, of the copper is 2,500 degrees Celsius. And there is your therefore statement and final answer. Essentially what we did in this question, we did our diagram, we did our givens here, we solved for the change in water, the change in temperature for the water, we did the algebra necessary to isolate uh, initial temperature of the copper, or T1C, and we just subbed in our values and rounded to the appropriate number of significant figures. And that is how you solve question six on page 13 of the energy workbook.